South Miami, when we came here, they only had one policeman and they had one fireman. There was about, in, in the city itself, maybe two to 300 residents. Well, if you went down on Kendall Drive and you were up across the railroad track, there was nothing but fields of all kinds of farm fields, tomatoes, you know, things like that, beans, as far out as you can go, all the way to Chrome. Uh, I lived in a neighborhood where everybody loved everybody, and all children were everybody were the village's children. Well, my family moved from the Gables here in 1954. Till you got your whistle at, at dusk, you were out just like little Indians. There was nothing but woods, and we just roamed wild. It's a small town with access to all of the uh, big city kind of attractions, and it happened to be five minutes from where I worked. Henry Flagler's railroad opened South Florida for development and created new opportunities for pioneers like Wilson Alexander Larkins, who moved from Tennessee with his family in 1898. He opened the area's first general store on a dirt road just south of today's Cocoa Plum Circle and opened the first post office. By 1903, the Florida East Coast Railway had reached Miami and started building southward towards the Keys. The planners opted to curve inland to higher ground as they got to what was now being called Larkins. Mr. Larkins had the good sense to move his store and the post office next to the railroad tracks. The new Larkins was soon bustling. The Dorn brothers, Robert and Harold, established a dry goods store, a nursery, and a packing plant alongside the tracks as well. Lumbermen, hoteliers, grocers, and farmers soon added to the bustle. In 1912, Marshall Williamson came to Larkins. He wasn't allowed to buy land east of the railroad tracks, but he became the first black landowner and builder in what was being called Blacktown. He donated land for churches and the first school for black children in the area. A school is still on that site. We lived on the last street in what we call Blacktown. As I walked to school, we walked our street to 62nd Avenue down to the school, which was on, I believe, 66th Street now. It was totally segregated. These are the approximate boundaries of South Miami's black community in 1938. Blacks were not allowed east of US-1 for many years, except to work. If you know where to look, there are still signs of the segregation. A wall built to separate the black area from a new white neighborhood and the dead-end streets that isolated the community. Blacks had jobs at the cannery, in the fields, and operated businesses in their neighborhood. Grocery stores, barbershops, eateries, and beauty parlors, often in their own homes. Here you had Alexander's restaurant, and the back of it was why I told you the teenagers had a place to dance, and then Miss Lottie Powell turned it into a hair dresser's parlor there. In 1926, a killer hurricane hit Miami and severely affected South Miami. The destruction was widespread, forcing many into tents. The city of South Miami was incorporated the following year. And just as the newly created city was rebuilding, the stock market crash and the Great Depression meant that many people went hungry. They used to call my dad Mr. Eddie. He owned the Bar City Grill, which was a local hangout for the University of Miami. But he never refused a homeless person a meal. He always said, you, you go in the back, he'll feed you, you behave yourself, and you'll eat. Arden Hayes Thomas, a pharmacist from Indiana, came to town just in time for the Great Miami Hurricane. He opened the OK Drug Store on the north side of Sunset Drive, eventually adding a feed and seed store, which did business for years as the OK Feed Store. In 1931, Doc Thomas, as he was affectionately known, built a handsome framed cottage for himself and his mother using natural woods and oolitic limestone from the area. The home has been added to the National Register of Historic Places 
and houses the Tropical Audubon Society, to whom Thomas donated the property upon his death in 1975. The Dorn brothers built a fancy movie house called the Riviera Theater in 1925, but it closed following the hurricane because people could no longer afford to go to the movies. It sat empty for years until it was bought by the Fuchs family, who moved their business from Homestead to South Miami. The old theater was converted into a modern bakery, the Wholesome Bakery, becoming a major employer, filling the air with delicious aroma of baking bread, and attracting visitors to their annual Christmas displays. In the 1950s, South Miami was a thriving small town in a big city and prided itself on having a business district where you could buy oven-fresh bread, feed for your horse, seed for your garden, and rent a tuxedo for a fancy event. Most everything anybody needed you could find in South Miami's downtown, and it was safe enough for children to roam the streets with their neighbor friends. Everybody had a pony. We, we were using ponies as often as we were using our bicycles. I mean, it was just a different life then. The moms were all home during the day and the dads would come home from work at whatever time and we would all sit down to dinner and they would be backyard barbecues every weekend and everybody knew everybody. In the 1960s, the historic Southern racial segregation in schools was altered by busing. While tensions were described as high, South Miami did not have the violent outbursts that hit other cities. It, it, it was just an atmosphere of community involvement that has always, not only at South Miami Middle School, but throughout the city. We had black representation on the commission during those tumultuous years. When the Wholesome Bakery outgrew its South Miami plant, it moved to Medley. The old plant was eventually torn down and replaced with a round shopping mall called the Bakery Center. The name was nostalgic, but the design of the mall did not fit with the open and friendly atmosphere of downtown South Miami. It was declared a mistake, torn down and replaced with Sunset Place, more successful but still not in keeping with the small town feeling so cherished by the residents. A new downtown development plan is in the works. This is a consortium of people who understand how cities work and who want to turn the place inside out and re recreate the sidewalk life and the pedestrian life. Um, so they're going to do a lot of opening up of, the, of the, the structures. They're going to make that parking garage mesh with the rest of it. They're going to cut passage, wide passageways through and create a, a much more of a, a walkable um, condition there. And then ultimately they're going to put in a lot of residential and probably a hotel as well. So there will be enough people there to sustain our downtown. So it'll do a lot of things that'll, that'll really perk up the commercial part of South Miami. From a community built around farming and the railroad, the city of South Miami is shifting its perspective to being about people. From the point of view, from politics all the way down to the individual, that's been the answer to South Miami. This commission right now is just like every other commission. They're very, very uh, connected to the black community. I can see a lot of very positive things going on in the community, uh, but there will always be that older cadre of the community in all of the communities who just want to, you know, they're in their comfort zone. In their comfort zone, and that's fine. We set a lot of trends down here in terms of places that we think society should go and the way people should live and treat one another. And we're a leader. You can live together and still maintain some connection with the natural world. And that's something that South Miami um, holds dear. And we model. We show that to people.